It's wonderful to see so many people. So I'm Marcia Philbin. I'm the chief executive of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine. For those of you who are not familiar with pharmaceutical medicine, <clears throat> um, pharmaceutical physicians are doctors who are involved in the development of medicines. And you might be wondering, what has statistics got to do with medicine? Well, statistics is very important in the development of medicine, particularly in assessing the safety and ensuring that they're fit for purpose. So that's why we're delighted to welcome Dr. Nara Chamberlain to give this webinar. This is our first um, activity to celebrate Black History Month. And Dr. Chamberlain will give us a history of the black heroes of mathematics, but also give us an indication of how statistics is important in medicine. So without further ado, I'll turn over to Naira. Well, thank you very much indeed, Marcia, and thank you very much indeed for, for uh, inviting me to do this talk to, uh, to start off the celebration of Black Heroes Month. Now, Black History Month, I should say. So um, now, one of the things I, would, I want to uh, say is if you actually enjoy this talk about the Black Heroes of Mathematics, there's actually going to be a virtual conference on the 26th and 27th of October called believe it or not, the Black Heroes of Mathematics, where we will have black mathematicians from all around the world giving talks, whether testimonies or technical. And this has been the joint uh, um, venture of four mathematical bodies here in the UK. So this is something that we're going to look looking forward to. So if you're interested in that, search online and join that conference. So as saying, a little thought of the day, and when we're talking about scientists versus public perception of probability. Now, people don't really actually realize that there's actually different types of probability. There's what's called frequentis and there's what's called propensity, which is feelings. Now, frequentis is probably what you was taught in school. So let's say, what's the probability of, of, of tossing a coin and getting the heads? Well, you're thinking there's, there's two possibilities. One of them is being the head, so henceforth the probability is a half. That's frequentist. Propensity is much more to do is how do I feel? Do I feel that this is going to work? Um, but the, pro the issue is, is that when it comes to, let's say, scientists and to um, um, general public, how we actually communicate, most of us, we tend to communicate through our feelings, through propensity. So even with a scientist, when we do, let's say, a clinical trial and we're saying, right, the probability of this of you getting an illness is very, very, very small. Sometimes the way we actually communicate it, we communicate it as if it's not going to happen. I'll give you an example. Let's say, for instance, we're building a, a flood protection and we will say, well, the probability of, it, uh, of a flood occurring is very small. It's like in a one in a thousand chance, but the, the, very next, the very next day, a flood actually occurs. You know, for, this, for those people who experience a flood, the propensity is saying, wait a minute, the way you actually communicated this to me, you communicated it to me as if it was impossible for it actually to occur, when actually the probability said, even though the probability is small, there is still a chance of it actually occurring. So the way we actually communicate our, our probabilities, recognizing that we, we must communicate our probabilities in a frequentist way, but recognizing that people will um, look at probability based on their feelings. For instance, a lot of people that, that do, let's say, um, gambling and um, doing, let's say, looking at the horse racing, again, it's not based on frequencies, it's based on feelings. I feel that this horse would win. I feel that this horse will, will lose. And that's how most people perceive probability. So the way that we communicate probability and the way that we use probability is very important. We must recognize when we are using it in a frequentist way and whether we're using it in a, in a propensity way, our feelings. Right, so that concludes the scientific versus public perception of probability. So, moving on, I will now start officially the, the talk, Black Heroes of Mathematics. This talk actually starts in May 2019. In May 2019, there was a new website, a new website that said this, Mathematics is indisputably the greatest subject in the world. Why? It teaches science to scientists, engineering to engineers, technology to technologists, 
Mathematics law is all around you. Mathematics is a powerful and beautiful subject. Now, this was this website, which was actually a very good website, and it won uh, a number of awards. So what was interesting, though, was it also talked about the mathematicians behind the mathematics. So they were talking about people like Euler, Turing, Germain, Gauss, Lovelace, Nash, Ramanujan, Erdos, Mazedinin, Leibniz, Fermat, but stop, stop, wait a minute, where are the black mathematicians? I repeat again, I see all those mathematicians and they all are great, but where are the black mathematicians? Now, I sent um, uh, an email to this group and said, look, this website is really good. I really enjoy it. But there is a whole group missing. Where are the black mathematicians? So the question is, where are the black mathematicians? I'm not the only person that asked that question. There was recently a, a article in the New York Times where it says what I learned about the dearth of black mathematicians. And the question is, are black mathematicians, are they hidden or they don't exist, you know? So, now what one thing that this uh, article in the New York Times said, it said, it reports about an incident that happened with the American Mathematical Society, which is one of the most influential mathematical societies in the world. And back in 1969, the nearly all white um, membership, they actually rejected a, res a resolution to address the shortage of black and Hispanic mathematicians in its, ra in its rank. So from this, you can actually see that this is the start of mathematics actually having a checkered history. Now, because they made that decision of not addressing the shortage of black and Hispanic mathematicians in its rank, what you find is that there are consequences for today. Out of 46 million African Americans in the USA, only approximately 300 have a PhD in mathematics. This statistics come from the book from Dr. Eric Walker, Black Mathematicians and the Pursuit of Excellence. Also, talking about the checkered history of mathematics, there was, there was a time when mathematics was used to justify slavery. This gentleman, Thomas Jefferson, he is one of the first um, um, presidents of the United States. But before he became president, a secretary of state, he justified slavery by saying this, comparing them by their faculty of memory, reasoning and imagination, it appears to me that in memory, the Negroes, that's black people, are equal to whites. In reason, much inferior, as I think one could scarcely be found capable of chasing and comprehending the investigation of Euclid, which is a mathematician, and that in imagination, they are dull, tasteless and anomalous. So, Coming to the modern day, there was, an, uh, there was an article written in The Guardian where a, uh, a, a right-wing um, journalist once said this. One of the claims, he says that black people, there has been no winners of the Phil Medal. Now, the Phil Medal is known as the, it's probably the Nobel um, Prize of Mathematics. This is the highest award that you can win in mathematics. And it's been around for the last 70 years. And there's never been a black mathematician that's won a, a film medal. Now, according to this uh, journalist, he says that this implies that because there's no winners of the, of the film medal, it means that black people are incapable of genius. Yeah? So, but also in this New York, um, New York Times, it claims that when you talk, look at the researchers in, in, in America, they believe that there's the reason why there are not that many black uh, mathematicians who research mathematics is because African Americans are not intelligent as other races. So really and truly, when we're talking about the, the issues here, there are, let's say, two factors. There's one, low expectation of black people. And also, there's, a, there's a, something internal within the community called Stereotypical typical threat or stereotype threat. It means that if I, me, Nora Chamberlain, if I pursue mathematics 
and fail at it, will I be confirming one of the stereotypes of black people, which is the belief that black people are intellectually inferior. My name is Naira Chamberlain, and this is my story. That's how I used to look like on the left-hand side. That's me when I was around about seven and eight. Now, when I was seven and eight, all my friends were into Batman and Superman and Spider-Man. But you know what I like doing? I like picking up a calculator, an electronic calculator, and pressing the buttons until the numbers were all flashing at me. Yeah, that's what I was into. I was somehow I was pretending or playing that I was somehow some super mathematician. Yeah, but as I was growing up, there were no black heroes of mathematics. The heroes in my time tend to be sports stars or musicians. But me, I was still into pressing these calculators and I also was into um, watching logical detective stories like Columbo. But when I was about 14, 15, I went to my careers teacher and the careers teacher was asking me, he says, Naira, what would you like to do as a career? What would you like to do when you grow up? And I said, well, I wouldn't mind doing something that involved logic and mathematics. I wouldn't mind doing that. And the career teacher said this to me, he says, Naira, somebody of your physique, you should become a boxer. And I thought, I'm sorry, he said, yes, you should become a boxer. Now, quite discouraged, I went home and told my parents. Now, my parents are from the Windrush generation. They came to, um, to England in the 1960s. And when I told them what the career teacher told me, they said this to me, they said, you don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. I repeat, you don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. And I said, well, look, mom, dad, well, mom, you work in a hospital, dad, you work in a car factory, but you know, this is a teacher. And at, back then I put the teacher's opinion above my parents, you know, I was at, of that age. But so I was only half believing what my parents said. And so I went on and I went on and I did um, my, my A-levels, went on and did my mathematics degree, did my masters. But using a, a, a football analogy, in terms of mathematics, I was more like a fan of mathematics. So using a football analogy, it's like I would go to football stadiums and watch football players playing football, but never imagine myself being a football player. So with me, I would go to mathematical conferences and watch all of these great mathematicians doing all the crazy things on the whiteboard or on the blackboard, thinking, oh, I wish I could do that. I was very much a fan of mathematics. I never imagined myself doing that. I was like watching them. But one time I went to Edinburgh and I, I was surrounded by a group of people and they were the Congress of African-American research mathematicians. And one of them uh, said to me, he says, Naira, do you know that there are historical reasons why there are not that many black people that do a PhD in mathematics? And he said this to me, he said, Naira, somebody of your enthusiasm and your passion should really do a PhD in mathematics. So all full of enthusiasm and passion, I went back to Birmingham and I went to a certain university in Birmingham and applied to doing a PhD in mathematics. And what happened was when I was, uh, when I was invited for the interview, I went in and I said to the professor said, yeah, I want to do a PhD in mathematics. And he said this to me, he says, Naira, you are technically weak and naive if you ever think that you can do a PhD in mathematics. Discouraged, I went home. And my parents said this to me, Naira, you don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. I said, mom, dad, out of respect, you work at the, in a hospital, you work in a factory, a teacher at school says I can't be a mathematician, this professor says I can't be a mathematician, so that's it, I'm done, I'm finished, I'm not doing mathematics anymore, that's me, I'm finished. Then, a couple of years later, the, um, you know, I had a family, and the gentleman on the left is Philip. That's, he's my son, age four. And he went to um, his infant school and the infant school teacher said to him, Philip, what would you like to be when you grow up? And Philip says, I would like to be a mathematician. And the teacher said this to him, Philip, you will never be a mathematician. 
but you might grow up to be a singer. Now, Philip came back home and told me this. And when I heard this, I was really angry. I wanted to go to that school and give that teacher a piece of my mind. And then I paused and I thought, wait a minute. I remembered what my parents said to me. They said to this to me, he said, you don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what role model am I to my son? Because he's probably seen me giving up on my dreams to become a mathematician. And he had no defense, no comeback to that teacher who tried to discourage him from pursuing his dreams. And I'm thinking, actually, my parents were right. I don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. So I decided to go for it. And I decided to become what was known as a mathematical modeling consultant. And what I was doing is I would solve real world um, um, problems all around Europe. You know, when I see, I see those problems that people didn't think could be solved using mathematics and I would go after it because I never quit because that was my passion. I was being a mathematician, yeah? And, and as I was, I was getting quite successful and getting a reputation as a mathematician that would solve real world problems. Now, one day, there was a Royal Navy captain and he approached me and he goes, Naira, I said, hello. I said, you've got a reputation of solving real world problems, problems that people don't think that can be solved. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's me. And he goes, well, we have a problem with a future ship. I said, really? And he said, yes. Well, the ship is very expensive to build and it's actually unaffordable to run. And he says, do you think you can come up with a mathematical way of actually solving this? And I said this to him, I said, okay, have you ever heard the story Goldilocks and the Three Bears? And he says, you what? I said, yeah, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. See, Goldilocks, she goes into her house, she sees a porridge, she eats his porridge and says, that one's too hot. She eats the next porridge and says, that one's too cold. And she eats the uh, next porridge and she said, this one's just right. I said, that's how you solve your problem. And he just looked at me and he walked away and I didn't see him again for another two weeks. Two weeks later, he came up to me and says, Naira, I said, yes, would you like to follow me? So I followed him and I walked into a meeting and it looked like this. And I said, hello. And they said, hello, we're, um, we're having this meeting to discuss about this future ship. We're thinking about um, cancelling uh, this project. And we've heard that you've come up with a solution. And I said, yes, I have. I said, would you like to tell us about it? I said, okay, have you heard the story Goldilocks and the Three Bears? And it says, I beg your pardon. I said, Goldilocks and the three bears. You see, Goldilocks, she goes into the house, she sees this porridge, that's too hot, that's too cold, and this one's just right. I said, that's how you solve your problem. And then they said this to me. Do you realize that this project is off of national importance and you're coming up with some sort of nursery rhyme? And I said, oh, okay, wait, wait a minute. Okay, let me be, be, be a bit more specific. What you need to do is get that ship, look at this design, link its designs to its capability, link it to its cost, and that will, what that will do, it will create a whole series of nonlinear mathematical equations. Put that into a computer, then write an algorithm, and then say to that algorithm, design me a ship that's not too hot, not too cold, just right. And here's an example. And I said, oh, actually, we think that one might actually work. See, now, that was over 10 years ago. See, the question is, would you like to see what that ship looks like today? I just admit I held my breath as she came here through the harbour entrance because it's so small. Proud Navy family coming here to see the ship going in. Uh, my husband had worked on the programme, so it's been kind of a lot of our lives. In fact, our wedding cake was the Queen Elizabeth Carrier. It was brilliant, worth waiting for. It's a brilliant experience. It'll take some time to build up the operating envelope and our understanding of the complexity uh, of operating uh, a ship of this scale. But we've done a lot in preparation for that, working with both the French and the United States Navy. Okay. Right.
Right. Okay. So the um, HMS Queen Elizabeth, which is one of the, uh, which is, is the largest um, aircraft carrier they have ever had. And somewhere uh, on that ship is the platform and it says, uh, Dr. Nara Chairman, and it will remain there for the next 50, uh, ne for the next 50 years. Cool. So, and so as, as well as that, um, you know, working as a, um, as a mathematical consultant, I decided to start a part-time PhD in mathematics. And what I did is I, I found a supervisor who looked at the merits of my academic ideas rather than my race. So, and so that was good. And so um, after a number of years, I actually completed my, uh, uh, my PhD in mathematics. And in this picture, you can see my wife there, Jacqueline. That, this is uh, Philip, uh, much older than in the, in the previous picture, and my son, Nathan. And one of the interesting things that happened after the PhD was um, a couple of days later, I was actually um, named uh, by the Science Council as being one of the UK's top 100 scientists for my developing mathematical applications for, uh, for industry. So moving on. And now what's interesting here is that there's a book called The Who's Who. Now the Who's Who has been around since um, 1849. Now, if you reach the top of your profession, um, you make it into The Who's Who and you, you will remain in the book every year until you pass away and then you move into another book called Who Was Who. Now, at the moment, there are about 30,000 people in the who's who, of which there are only 30 mathematicians. And so examples of mathematicians in who's who is like, you've got this Oxford professor university um, gentleman named Professor Marcus de Sotoy. Uh, you have this professor, Tim Fugawa, uh, who, who won the Field Medal, who's at Cambridge University. Uh, you got Professor Andrew Wiles, who, who works at Princeton University, a, a, a top university in America. And he's um, famous for solving one of the hardest problems in, in mathematics called the Fermat-Last Theorem. And let's say you've got all these different selections of different mathematicians who are actually in a, in a who's who. But 2015 was quite significant because in 2015, I actually became the first black mathematician to get into the who's who. So I was thinking, okay, all of this is good. I got my PhD. I'm a um, top 100 scientist, first black mathematician in the who's who. That's it. My life, in terms of mathematics mission, that's it. It's over. It's done. I'm happy. I can move on with the rest of my life. My, rest of my life. Right? Wrong. I had a personal challenge from this uh, lady here. Her name is P Professor Magefi Fanken, and she is the first black female mathematician in South Africa to get a PhD in mathematical education. And she said this to me, she said, being the first is not something to be proud of, but it's a calling to ensure that one is not the last. And I said that again, being the first is not something to be proud of, but it's a calling to ensure that one is not the last. So I was thinking, well, actually, I'm the first black mathematician in the who's who, but currently I am the last. So I was thinking, well, what can I do to, to, uh, to deal with this? So, and then all of a sudden, around about that time, I was hearing the rumors about a film called um, Hidden Figures. And you know, Hidden Figures was about, you know, three African Americans, uh, mathematicians who worked for NASA. And so this will just show you a little background about the film Hidden Figures. It was the early 60s and America was on the brink. The Cold War was being fought in the sky while the civil rights movement was playing out in the streets. Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson were at the center of it all. Three African-American women working as mathematicians at NASA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. They were actually called human computers by NASA officials and their skills changed the space program forever. Johnson did the math that put John Glenn into orbit and helped make this possible. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Vaughn became NASA's first black supervisor and Jackson became the agency's first black female aerospace engineer. Yet despite their impact, for decades, their stories were untold and their place in history ignored. But thanks to Taraji P. Henson, Octavia Spencer, and Janelle Monet, they are no longer hidden figures. So, 
the main star of that of that film, which the story was based on, was Katherine Johnson. And this is her in 2015 on the left hand side, receiving a pre the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama. And on the right hand side, you can see her in the blue. She's getting a standing ovation at the uh, at the Oscars award ceremony. Now, one of the things that um, got me was this: is that these ladies they were working in NAS for NASA during the 60s, 70s and 80s. So you had these mathematicians working for NASA in that time. This was around about the same time, well, one of those decades, I won't tell you which one, is when I was actually, a, a, um, when I was at junior school, when I was at secondary school, and when my teacher actually told me that I couldn't, um, told me to become a boxer. So I was thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, surely, you know, these, you know, these mathematicians, you know, they were, not only were they hidden from me, but they're also hidden from, uh, uh, from the career teacher and what was interesting was the actual the, the consultant for Hidden Figures was a gentleman named Dr Rudy Horn. Now do you remember me telling you about me going to Scotland um, and being surrounded by those um, African-American mathematicians and one of them said to me somebody of your passion and enthusiasm should do a PhD in mathematics. Well that person was actually Rudy Horn. See that's my connection to the film Hidden, Hidden Figures. So with that, I decided to um, target Black History Month. I decided to go to various Black, um, black History Months to see whether they actually talk about, um, um, talk about Black mathematicians and the scene where, where there are other Black mathematicians there. But this is what I found when I was going to a variety of different Black History Months. I kept on seeing Beyonce and Beyonce and Beyonce and Beyonce, you know, uh, 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 you know what? I'm sick and tired of seeing Beyonce and Beyonce and Beyonce. I asked, asked them the, the following question. Where are the black engineers? Where are the black scientists? You know, I cannot see no, none of them being profiled at none of these um, events for Black History Months. So... I went to um, a variety of organizations asking these questions, but more specifically, I'm saying, where are the black mathematicians? And these um, um, event organizers said, well, actually, we don't know about black mathematicians, but you're a mathematician. Why don't you do the research and you come up uh, with a, a poster and then you, you help us you know, promote black mathematicians. So I thought, okay, that's a personal challenge. So I decided to create a social media campaign called the Black Heroes of Mathematics. When I put it onto social media, the response from it, from both the mathematics community and the black community worldwide was tremendous. And then I decided actually to turn this, um, uh, this poster into a talk and then into a, a, a hybrid um, music and presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you the black heroes of mathematics.
Okay. So, now, that was the music video, The Black Heroes of Mathematics. Now, one of the people that I actually talked about in that video was this lady here, Keita Adbey, Adibeola Akikululu. Now, she is one of the best right now. Now, the reason why she's one of the best right now is because back in 1997, she won the something called the Sloan Research Fellowship. Now, when an American actually wins that, there is a strong likelihood that they would actually go on and win the Field Medal. Now, she won that two years before before this gentleman on the left name is Terence Taho. Now Terence Taho is one of the greatest mathematicians in the world. Now he went on, uh, he won the Sloan Award two years after Kate, but he went on six years later to, to get the, the Field Medal. So out of all the black mathematicians out there in the history, she has been the one that comes the, the closest to winning the uh, the Field Medal. And also she, in 2001, she was the first African-American female to, to publish in the most respected uh, mathematical journal, the Annals of Mathematics. And one of the greatest of all time now is this gentleman here, his name is David Blackwell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a quick video of David Blackwell. And he was not only a mathematician, he was also a very great statistician as well. What were the odds this Illinois child would become one of the world's great mathematicians? David Blackwell was game to try. I was always pretty good at, at mathematics. I don't know that I had favorite subjects. I, I studied whatever you were told to study. Did it as well as I could, but I looked forward to recess. <laughs> I was a good student, mind you. Such a good student that by age 22, he had earned a PhD from the University of Illinois. There's a lot of luck in things. Uh, the, the man that I chose as my thesis advisor was far and away the best possible choice I could have made. His field, probability theory, turned out to have a lot of appeal for me. Uh, it turned out that I like to think that way. Blackwell wanted to teach mathematics, and he wanted to serve at historically black colleges and universities. I got a list of all the black colleges from some almanac. And there were 105 of them. I wrote 105 letters. I actually accepted the, the first offer of, that I received as soon as I got it. And my really serious mathematical work started at Howard. At Howard, the intellectual atmosphere was just different. Suppose that every day a machine produces a number, either zero or one. In the mid-50s, Blackwell joined and soon after headed the University of California, Berkeley's newly created statistics department. Over the years, Blackwell continued to expand mathematics by introducing game theory, decision theory, and information theory into the field. Let's suppose in particular that we knew that all these XNs were greater than or equal to a half. David Blackwell, the first African-American elected to the National Academy of Sciences, dedicated to assisting disadvantaged students in the U.S. and Africa. First, the advice I would give to young people generally is try everything and keep looking until you find something that you like. Okay, so now what we're going to do is just going to tell you about the new black heroes of mathematics, the mathematicians that are probably going to make in their names right now and in the near future. So we have this gentleman here, Adibisi Abigula, who is uh, one of the leading pure mathematicians in America at this moment. Talita Washington, who's one of the leading um, mathematicians in terms of learning about the history of black mathematicians and also uh, very talented at, at data science. This lady here, Chaktia Jackson, who is a talented mathematician that looks at the mathematics and modeling of the, the spread of cancer in the, in the body. And this guy here named Justice Ayahito, who's at this present moment, is leading the, the charge on ma doing mathematical modeling of COVID in West Africa. 
But what's interesting is this person here, John Urchell, who's at the moment, he's doing a PhD. But John Urchell, he used to be a, a, an NFL footballer. Now, what he says, he says this. You know, sometimes I find myself with young African, African-American would-be mathematicians, hearing them asking how I managed to get to where I am and watch them hold back tears when, I talk, when, when talking about being behind or feeling like they cannot succeed because they do not have the background. He also says this, is that I have a responsibility to set good example for young people everywhere who have mathematical talent but may feel like they cannot succeed because they do not look like those who have succeeded before. I have a responsibility to succeed not just for myself, but for my mother, my grandparents, and every minority who feels like the field is close to them. Yeah. So taking that example, one of the things that um, I do, and uh, I've been doing this for the last six, six years, is I work for a charity called Target Oxbridge, which what they get is they get the most talented um, um, black students in the, in the country who are, who are aspiring to go to um, uh, Oxford or Cambridge to do mathematics or one of the mathematical sciences, and I give them a two-day a two-day mathematical masterclass. This year was a little bit different because of COVID, had to do it virtual, but it was still very successful. Now, with this class uh, of 2019, this was one of my most successful years where out of the 11, nine of them actually made it into Oxford and Cambridge, and there's been a number of them in the past who've made it into Oxford and Cambridge University. So, one of the things I have to say in conclusion is that hidden figures Hidden Figures tells us the story of three African-American mathematicians working for NASA. There are more hidden figures who show that mathematics is for everybody. But before we end, I'd like to go with this epilogue where I show two cartoons, the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the left is quite negative. It comes from a Canadian newspaper. When it heard a story about there was a school trying to raise the aspiration of black children to do mathematics, they put up this... Um, this cartoon where they're actually mocking a, a black teacher and mocking the mathematics that he's doing, yeah? And this one on the right, this cartoon of Marjorie Lee Brown, who was one of the first black mathematicians, female black mathematicians to get a PhD in mathematics. And what I want to work to is work away from the picture on the left and create more images onto the right. But before I end, there's some strings I need to tie up. Thank you for listening. Naira? Hello? Hello, Naira. That yeah. was incredible, absolutely incredible. And I just want to thank you for such an inspiring and brilliant talk. Um, we might have time for a few questions. I'm just looking in the chat box and um, let me just uh
have a look. Um, there's somebody who is a primary school teacher and maths coordinator. And uh, you have more information about it. And she's asking about resources um, to share with children of a primary age. Because as you rightly said, there are so many hidden thing, um, figures. I mean, the stories that you told are just incredible. But also, you know, I mean, uh, me thinking about when I was growing up, we just didn't see these things. So, you know, are there resources out there that teachers yeah. can access? Yes, there's, a, there's more resources. There, there, are, there are resources out there. I mean, certainly the post, uh, the Black Heroes of Mathematics, um, that's on my, um, I'm on my blog, and I will send you the link so that you can actually share it to, uh, to, the, to the delegates. But yes, there are, uh, there are resources. There are more and more resources out there. But there's, there's much more focus, you know, you know on, on black mathematicians and also black STEM as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And just to let everybody know, this has been recorded and it will be on the FPM website. So um, if you want to sh uh, watch it again or show it to someone, you can do so. Um, Bina um, also said thank you for a brilliant talk and is asking, what would you say to the Secretary of State for Education if you met him today? Yeah, if I, if I saw the Secretary of State for Education today, I'd say, please do not use that algorithm ever again to determine people's, uh, people's grades. And Naira, for the benefit of us, what went wrong in, what, from your perspective? Okay, well, what went wrong is that they, they, they bought an algorithm which they didn't test. They're supposed to test it first. And once you test it and realize that, guess what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to produce a certain result then you don't roll it out, you know, you have to test it, know all, all the results that it's, it's going to do before you, before you roll it out. So there was no, there was no muted algorithm. The algorithm just did not work. That's, that's, that's my view. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Alicia is asking, do you know the stats on the number of black mathematicians with a PhD in the UK? No, I mean, um, in, the, in America, I mean, in America, that's where they actually collect the, the, collect the stats. Um, we probably, in terms, of, um, in terms of the UK, uh, they don't collect stats in terms of black mathematicians, but they do collect stats on the number of black academics, the number of black professors, and we are definitely underrepresented. So if, if that figure's underrepresented, then you can say that black mathematicians are underrepresented. Yeah. Hopefully, with this conference we, uh, that we're doing at the end of October, we want to show a showcase of black mathematicians from around the world and increase the number of black mathematicians. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I love that um, quote from your parents. Because in, in a way, right, you, you and me, we, we're from the same background, you know, mm -hmm. with our parents, Windwash generation. And I remember being told certain things when I was at school. And I went home to my parents and said, what I said and I said I'll show them for children now who are still getting those negative messages what would you say to them well I'd say well in, in terms of what my parents you know I'd say to them exactly what my parents said to me you don't need anybody's permission to be a great even though I can say, you can say mathematics you can replace that uh, you can replace that with, with whatever I mean it, it has a nice rhyme. You don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. And certainly when I did a version of this talk at a, at a theatre, I had uh, somebody came up to me and says, listen, I'm not a mathematician and I know that you're talking about black mathematicians, but I'm autistic and that talk actually spoke to me. Did I mean, yeah. even though I, do, you know, I have an aspiration, the aspiration to become a mathematician, I want to be, I want to be this different career, but you don't need anybody's permission. And, and that's, what I'd, that's what I'd say to, uh, to everybody. Okay, right. Jacqueline has got her hands up. Um, do you want to come off mute, Jacqueline, and um, ask a question? Are you there, Jacqueline? I'm trying to. F Jacqueline, is it Jacqueline Charles? You've got your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? No. Okay. Um, David Thomas. Um, he's asking. How old is too old to return to academia and a PhD? I was always told math and math, mathematicians peaked at 20. <laughs> well, you, you say that mathematicians peaked at 20. I've heard that mathematicians hit peak at 20. I heard that mathematicians peak at 21. I heard that mathematicians peak at, uh, <laughs> at 30. But I, I can safely say that I'm not revealing my age, but I'm <laughs> safe to say that um, I'm a strong, I'm much strong, um, 
I haven't petered yet as mathematically. I'm still getting stronger and stronger. But to answer, to your, answer, to answer the gentleman's question, you're never too old. You're never too old. Um, one of the things that... Um, you know, as the older you get, yeah, one of the one of the advantages that you do have is that you bring in quite a bit of life experience into your study, yeah, yeah. and that makes your study much more more sharper, you know, because you're bringing in saying, well, I remember when I saw this and I've seen this, and yeah, actually bring so for my PhD, which yeah. I did in my thirty my forties, I brought in a lot of my mathematical experience, uh, external experience into it, and it made my PhD much sharper because of that. So you're never too old. Never too old. And um, Andrew um, Hockey is asking, what's the relevance of golden ratio that's on every slide? Is there a special link? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, I just thought it was just a nice, um, you know, it's nice to have a nice, a nice mathematical symbol there. And um, that's why I put that in there. So it's just a nice, nice design. Yeah. Yeah. And David McKenzie says, by the way, maths and physics are the coolest things on the planet to me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, won't, I certainly won't disagree with, uh, with him with that. So, you know, I respect physics, yeah, and, but, you know. Yeah. 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 And, and right, another question from Bina um, says, I'm not a mathematician, but I understand correctly, algorithms are usually based on data collected in the past. Hmm. And if that data has biases within it, those biases get carried forward yeah. in the predictions from the algorithm. Yes. Since algorithms are now used for just about everything, how can we educate people about proper, proper use of algorithms? And this actually is really important. This is something that's coming in the fall also in medicines, right? um, w w um, like apps can't see black faces or black yeah. skin, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there, there's, a, there's two ways you actually can actually um, uh, answer that. Well, first things first, when you have, let's say, an algorithm that um, picks up let's say this data and let's say it's there's some biases is what you tend to do is one you can actually embed it into a simulation before you put it out in the real world to see exactly what it's predicting how well it predicts um let's see has it got us in the biases if it has got some biases then widen widen your your database widen the the, the diversity of, of your data that is using or if you're not going to put it in a simulation, if you're actually going to just go straight into the real world, always keep on looking and testing to see what are the what are the issues, and then refresh them, um, refresh that model with with new with new data. It's almost like when you're talking about algorithms, algor those type of algorithms is almost like putting bread into a into a supermarket. You don't leave the bread there for for 60 days and make that bread goes <laughs> goes green and mouldy. You have to keep on refreshing the bread. So so those algorithms are only as as good as the freshness of the data that you put into it so so the 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 wrong thing to do is just to put data in and just leave it alone and not to test not to check and and not to refresh the data and that's how and that's how you deal with these algorithms okay great um david mckenzie um you've got a question david do you want to ask a question you do you want me to read it out do you want to come off mute yeah just wanted to look nearer yeah. that was just phenomenal that presentation uh, absolutely just blew me away. Question I had for you, of course, getting maths to kids, need to get them early before they um, suddenly start thinking that maths is uncool and they, the Beyonce's in this world suddenly start to become important. <laughs> what, what do we need to do there? How do we reach out and grab them earlier just to try and enthuse them? Because I mean, what you presented was just, just got to everybody on this call, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. We just need to get an education better about showing kids that the maths and the science is so important. Yeah, I think, um... Um, the way to um, one of the ways to do it is to uh, show that uh, mathematics is is a very creative subject because when people think about mathematics they think it's it's very mechanical you know you get it you it's very rule based and you know you put one plus one equals two or it's, it's either right or wrong well well mathematics isn't uh, isn't all like that mathematics is very creative is is very creative and when you can actually uh, show the, the applications of mathematics and where it's been used. And I mean, one time I, um, um, I was doing a workshop with a school and uh, we, we did a, a mathematical workshop called Saving Aston Villa. And they had to <laughs> use this mathematical model to come up with a prediction to see whether Aston Villa would stay in the premiership. And they was fine. And they have to do a presentation with that. They was getting really infused and that was using algebra and probability and you know and spreadsheets and it's just showing you know getting them getting their hands and saying this is real world mathematics this is how mathematics is actually used in the real world fantastic you know i would have loved that because i grew up about two miles from aston villa so. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, thank you. You know, I'm just looking at the time. You know what? We could go on and on and on, but, um, you know, time has beaten us. And once again, Naira, thank you for such a brilliant and inspiring and enlightening presentation. And um, we've just put a link into the survey monkey. Please fill in the survey um, because, and just give us your feedback because this is the first time we've done something like this and we'd really value your feedback. Um, on the 16th of October, we have another presentation uh, webinar and this time it's going to be a fireside chat. And this is with Dr. John Indigum. Do um, John is a doctor. Uh, a black doctor, and he uh, was uh, worked on the front line during COVID-19. So he's going to talk to us about his experience, about his careers, um, but he's also a poet. And John has written a specially commissioned poem for FPM, which he will be reading to us. So please book onto that 16th of October, and we hope to see you there. And um, a link's just been put into the chat uh, for John Ingham's talk. So once again, I want to thank everybody for coming to this special webinar and learning about the black heroes of mathematics. Thank you. And I hope to see you again in the future.